During my school and college years, my weight was about 250 pounds, which made me the largest player on the football team compared to my peers. Unfortunately, my junior year was cut short when a severe knee injury put an end to my football aspirations. But instead of dwelling on this failure, I devoted myself to my studies and successfully earned a degree in accounting, paving the way for a new chapter in my life. My name is James, and I find satisfaction in my chosen profession of accountant. Overall, I am happy with most of my life journey. I was blessed by a loving and wonderful wife. So what could be wrong? But the memories of my weight during high school and college still haunt me. At the age of 35, I realized that I was not in the best shape, as my weight was approaching 300 pounds. Reality hit me hard. I was a ticking time bomb that could lead to a heart attack. Sarah, my wife, has been urging me lately to take action and solve the weight problem. Despite her efforts, I must admit that I made only weak attempts to follow her recommendations. I tried all the fitness plans and diets, but none of them brought positive results. I made a conscious effort to drastically reduce my carbohydrate intake and compensated for it with more meat, believing that it would help. But to my horror, I continued to gain weight despite all my efforts. I got to the point where my diet began to resemble the daily intake of a cow. To my surprise, I realized that consuming carbohydrates is actually more beneficial for me. In addition, excessive consumption of red meat caused a sharp increase in blood pressure. But one fateful night, everything changed. She was having trouble catching her breath under my weight, and it just got worse from there. Our usual argument about my weight started and eventually she dropped the bombshell that we wouldn't have any more intimate moments until I lost at least 50 pounds. Feeling offended and defeated, I retired to the guest room that night and went to work early the next morning. Deep down, I hoped that by the time I got home, the quarrel would have subsided, but it didn't happen. To my surprise, Sarah took matters into her own hands and found a weight loss camp for me on the internet. The camp lasted a whole month. She expressed confidence that it would be extremely useful for me, stressing that she was tired of being married to the heaviest man in the area, which embarrassed her. Intrigued, I studied the brochure she had printed out from the internet and immediately contacted the camp. Without hesitation, I made the payment and agreed on my departure on the earliest possible date. Although she asked if I was really going to go, I chose not to answer and just headed to the bedroom to pack my clothes and a few personal items. Losing weight will do you good. This will improve your overall health and well-being. A month will fly by unnoticed. I will definitely check on you every day, she assured. When I went to the guest room, she added, We're not mad at each other anymore. It's in the past. Why are you sleeping there? I replied, But you said we wouldn't sleep together until I lost the extra pounds. She clarified, I meant that we won't have sex until you achieve that goal. I had no sincere intention of saying what I said. My emotions got the better of me. It became clear to me that she was aware of the extent of the pain caused to her and was trying to make amends. But the idea of leaving home for a while seemed like a reasonable decision to me at that moment. As the days passed, I informed my colleagues at work that I was going on a trip not only to focus on personal growth, but also to assure them that my productivity would not suffer, as I would be working remotely. On the appointed day of departure, I hit the road, going to the airport early in the morning. I went on a trip to Tucson, where the scorching dry heat of the Arizona desert was waiting for me, which meant the beginning of the camp. For the first three weeks, I stayed in my usual physical shape. During the first week, I focused on setting up my internet and computer systems to ensure smooth operation during my stay at the camp. When the second week began, I turned my attention to observing what was happening around me. Although I refrained from actively participating, it was fun for me to watch the tasks that we had to complete and often laugh at their peculiarities. I used the food provided to us as a snack and then decided to order pizza or hamburgers with delivery. Interestingly, the delivery staff knows perfectly well that meeting me on the driveway 
often used by tourists for jogging, guarantees a more generous tip. I often sat at picnic tables enjoying a meal and then returned to my campsite. Therefore, after spending almost three weeks in such an environment, one might wonder how much weight I managed to lose. Surprisingly, I lost a discouraging six pounds, which means I was six pounds lighter than I was at the beginning of my arrival. Everything turned upside down a few days later when I received a message from Steve, an old acquaintance of mine. It turned out that about a year ago Steve went through a stormy divorce and is now slowly rebuilding his life. At the moment he wasn't particularly interested in finding another wife, he just wanted to have some fun and have fun. In his message he mentioned a date at a club with a woman who was much younger and more adventurous than him. To his surprise, he believed that he had noticed Sarah in the same establishment, accompanied by another man. He decided to check if it was really her, and it turned out to be true. She was accompanied by an unknown guy who touched her excessively. Trying to provide evidence, he discreetly took several photos, anticipating my disbelief or unwillingness to accept the truth. When I examined the pictures, it became clear that he was telling the truth. It was undoubtedly Sarah. I immediately recognized the unique necklace that I had personally made for her during our trip to Mexico the year before. At that moment, the meaning of my presence in the camp completely changed. It had a profound effect on me, completely changing my life. The next day I devoted time to thinking about my current situation and considering the desired changes. Although I considered myself a genuinely kind person with a wonderful life, there were several aspects that needed to be adjusted. The most important issue that required my attention was my weight and overall self-esteem. As soon as I get over this obstacle, I will deal with other problems. With a determined attitude, I went to the camp office the next morning and asked for a meeting with the director. I informed him of my urgent need to change my life, which prompted me to sign up for an exclusive three-month intensive program designed specifically for people on the verge of pathological obesity. Without hesitation, I started my journey that morning. Accompanied by a special training group, I went for a leisurely walk through the serene desert landscape. This two-mile walk was intentionally gentle to kickstart our metabolism and start burning calories before breakfast. I couldn't help but laugh at the idea, remembering my carefree days at school and college. I used to run about four miles every day at a decent speed. But this experience was a serious wake-up call for me. He opened my eyes to the fact that I had regressed dramatically and could no longer rely on my old school self. Despite the fact that I felt confident and fit as a football player, I barely covered only two miles, barely maintaining the right pace. To my surprise, several middle-aged women, who looked to be in their fifties, cheered me on and approved of my efforts when they easily overtook me, having covered only half a mile. My knee, sweating and struggling to move, throbbed with pain caused by a football injury. When I entered the cafeteria, I was hailed by many of my friends whom I had made during my stay at the camp. Their faces showed surprise at my sweaty appearance, but I knew they were just as deceitful as I was. Preferring solitude, I took refuge at a small table in the corner. Negative influence was the last thing I needed, especially now that I was determined to pursue my new goal. After finishing my breakfast, which consisted of half a glass of refreshing orange juice, a mouth-watering piece of toast, a generous half cup of fresh fruit, and two tempting slices of low-fat turkey bacon, I realized that my hunger remained unsatisfied. Despite this, my firm determination to transform remained. After breakfast, we were given a blissful hour to do whatever we wanted to do before our first seminar started. Taking advantage of this opportunity, I immediately used my precious hour to contact a private investigator and provide him with the necessary information about Sarah. Although this task did not cause me joy or impatience, it was simply necessary, and I simply had to do it. I was curious to find out how Sarah was connected to this guy and if there were any other relationships in her life. My feelings for Sarah were deep and on reflection, 
I was able to get into her situation. Depending on the level of intimacy she shared with this guy, there was a possibility that we could overcome this obstacle. When I went to the seminar, I made a conscious effort to really absorb the ideas shared by the speakers they had prepared for us. I listened carefully to the stories of previous camp participants who achieved significant weight loss and were able to successfully maintain the achieved result. Significant changes have taken place in their lives, and many of them attributed it to someone object, person or event that gave them the necessary drive and purpose after years of struggling with excess weight. Reflecting on my own path, I came to realize that the catalyst for change for me was the discovery of my beloved partner's infidelity. But it became obvious that it was not her who motivated me to change, but rather a desire to improve myself. At school and college I was always surrounded by women, and even after that I found companionship in Sarah. Consequently, I have never felt the need for introspection. The fear of losing her led to the realization that some aspects of myself needed to be transformed. As soon as I left the workshop building, my phone suddenly rang. To my surprise, it was Sarah who regularly called me every day. After talking to Steve, we haven't spoken in the last few days, as I was too injured to participate in the conversation. Hi, honey. Where have you been? I've missed your voice so much, she said. After explaining my situation, I said that I was juggling remote work and office duties. It was a difficult journey, an attempt to lose weight. But don't worry, you'll be back home in just two days and this fight will be behind you, she assured me. I couldn't resist answering. Sarah, I still haven't managed to lose weight so I can't go home yet. To my surprise, she replied, James, this number was just a random number that I named out of frustration. What really matters is that I miss you and I want you to come home, even if you've only managed to lose a couple of pounds. I have already achieved what I wanted. Sarah, I am fully committed to achieving my weight loss goals. If I'm really determined to succeed, I can make progress without leaving home, I replied firmly, not wanting to settle for anything less. I made a promise to myself that I would not return home until I had lost at least 50 kilograms and maybe more. Her statement struck a chord with me, emphasizing that she had achieved her desires, although she should have clarified who exactly she wanted. Not calming down, she continued to speak. Moreover, I've been thinking about some issues, and the thought of you coming home is really important to me. I have firmly decided, Sarah, that my decision has been made. Balancing work and weight loss while fully embracing the lifestyle here is proving to be very difficult, so we may have to reduce the frequency of communication until I complete this endeavor. Rest assured, I'm doing this for our common good. I don't want you to be ashamed of me anymore. Now I understand the enormous difficulties you faced during this period. I found out that I was being stalked by an ugly overweight man just because he had feelings for me, she admitted and there was regret in her voice. I shouldn't have said those words. It was just a momentary outburst of anger. I abruptly ended the conversation by turning off the call and went to change into comfortable clothes consisting of sweatpants and a hoodie to go to my morning workout. When I arrived at the gym, I decisively examined the surrounding environment. This time I decided to stand in the front rows rather than hide at the end. I didn't want to hide anymore. Our coach for the day was Debbie, a strict and straightforward person who left no room for excuses. She hasn't said a word the whole time I've been here. I caught a glimpse of her sneer a couple of times, but our paths never crossed in conversation. Even when I was in the front row, her gaze seemed to have an undeniable intensity, as if she hoped that just her gaze could make me step into the background, saving her from having to see my presence. Our session started with stretching and stretching exercises. Unfortunately, not only could I not reach my toes, but even my knees seemed out of reach. Despite my great efforts, I was barely able to make any progress. It seemed like an eternity had passed, and we hadn't even finished our warm-up. Even though I haven't done any serious exercise yet, I found myself sweating profusely. To my horror, 
Embarrassment set in soon after. Our training started with seemingly simple leg lifts, in which we had to raise our knees to waist level. Surprisingly, as soon as we finished this seemingly innocent exercise, my whole body was drenched in sweat, and Debbie grinning mischievously laughed at me. This was followed by hand lifts, with Debbie mercilessly pushing us to the point where I could no longer bear the weight of my own hands. And yet I persisted. Finally, we got down on the mat to face further humiliation. During my peak, I could easily squeeze out weights in excess of 200 pounds. But that day I was completely unable to even do push-ups. Despite my weak condition, I managed to gather enough strength for a single squat, after which I collapsed in exhaustion. When I left there, I couldn't take my eyes off Debbie's annoyingly smug expression. In search of solace, I took a refreshing shower and then joined my companions for lunch. After the meal, we were given an extra hour of free time. Taking advantage of this opportunity, I went to the clinic to examine my knee. The medical staff determined that I had suffered a minor sprain and immediately applied a supportive bandage to help me recover. I recently put a lot of strain on the muscles surrounding my joint, exceeding their normal limits. After consulting with a doctor, he recommended applying ice to the sore spot for several days to ensure full recovery. Surprisingly, the very next day I was able to walk on it, although with a warning against excessive loads. This procedure continued for the next week. In an effort to maintain discipline, I strictly adhered to the food offered, refraining from desserts and snacking only if absolutely necessary. Of course, the first five days turned out to be a painful ordeal. I know I've been the butt of a lot of jokes and constant laughter, and honestly, I deserved it after the first three weeks of being there. But despite the ridicule, I felt proud of myself. By the end of the first week, I had successfully lost eight pounds. In addition, that same week I received the first report from a private investigator. The report contained visual evidence, photos taken at the restaurant that Sarah visited with the gentleman, and even a recording of their conversation. Naturally, I wanted to visit this restaurant. In addition, there are photos of her entering the motel room with him. Judging by the length of their stay, it was quite obvious what they were doing. Strangely enough, her intimate encounters with him did not cause me as much pain as the discovery of humiliating statements about me that she made behind my back. The situation became even more alarming when the guy asked the reason for her final consent after persistent harassment for several months. No one warned me about this, which indicates that she has been hiding her secrets from me for a long time. It seemed that she had known this man since she was a student, but they had only recently started dating. In conversation, she admitted that she was tired and ashamed of me, claiming that my physical condition no longer satisfied her. So she sent me to the camp so that she would seek the company of a more masculine man. She asked how he managed to hide their affair from his wife. In response, he stated that, like her, he occupies a dominant role in his family. His wife obediently followed his instructions without asking any questions. This revelation deeply hurt me, and I came to the conclusion that our marriage is beyond repair. Having made a firm decision, I started the second week of intensive training, loading myself with morning walks. To keep myself busy after lunch, I started going to the pool. I also took up the development of skills such as archery and fencing. I was looking for hobbies that could keep me busy after I left camp. In addition, I decided to use the services of an experienced divorce lawyer. I told him in detail about the current situation, including how I got to the truth and made sure that he regularly received the latest news from a private investigator to keep abreast of all important events. Despite the fact that I did not have a specific time frame for solving the problem, I instructed him to prepare the necessary legal documents for filing. When the first month of intensive training came to an end, I felt a deep transformation that brought me closer to my previous lifestyle. Having lost almost 60 pounds, I experienced an unprecedented sense of well-being that has haunted me for many years. My daily routine has undergone significant changes. 
I used to get up earlier than usual and go for a three-mile run instead of the usual morning walk. Attending Debbie's classes has always been a constant in my daily routine, but there has been a noticeable shift in her attitude towards me. It seemed that she had dropped her judgmental gaze and instead began to smile warmly and greet me during our morning meetings. But the most amazing moment happened one morning during our workout, when I triumphantly completed the 10th push-up out of the 15 that we were trying to do, a weight suddenly fell on my back. Having gathered my resolve, I exerted all my strength and managed to do push-ups again, despite the additional load. Looking up, I noticed Debbie pressing down on my back to increase my resistance. In addition to effectively performing my work duties at the camp, I took the opportunity to make a list of friends and acquaintances. During regular meditation sessions, I switched my attention from motivation to lose pounds to analyzing my connections with these people. It dawned on me that for quite a long time, many of them did not share my laughter, but rather directed it at me. I have reached the point where my weight loss progress has stopped. Although I was still shedding pounds, the pace slowed down significantly. Despite the fact that I had already lost over 60 pounds, I could no longer maintain the impressive speed of one to one and a half pounds per day that I had achieved before. Reflecting on my past experience, I remembered how my coach at school forced us to do extra training if we appeared in bad shape during preseason training. Inspired by this, I decided to include a second longer run in my daily routine. This extra run proved to be more difficult. I will never be able to afford to run like I did when I was a student again. Still, I found great pleasure in running, gradually increasing the distance every day. Sometimes if I had enough strength left, I even went to the gym after a run to do weightlifting. But I approached it with caution, relying on the memories of my past athletic achievements. It was quite humiliating at first. For years I've been bragging about my ability to squeeze over 200 pounds. Squeezing 100 pounds turned out to be a difficult task for me. In addition, I was stunned by the inconsistency of my progress. Despite reaching the 100-pound milestone, I found that I hadn't been able to lift the same weight for over a week. Moreover, my legs were noticeably weak due to a permanent knee injury, which prevented me from doing squats and other intense leg exercises. A similar situation developed with back exercises, which slowed down my overall progress. Weakness in the knee joint limited my ability to perform tasks standing up. But over time, my condition gradually improved. Despite this progress, the pain in his heart remained constant. One evening, I tried to lift 170 pounds, and the first repetition was relatively easy for me. But the second repetition turned out to be difficult. In a more rational state, I would have realized the wisdom of abstaining from the third repetition. Unfortunately, my emotional state prevented me from showing common sense. I tried my best to lift the barbell, but I couldn't push it. I strained all my strength and racked my brain over how to get out from under her. Suddenly, I felt someone grab the barbell and start pulling it back. Together, we successfully returned the crossbar to its place. Debbie noticed. That wasn't very smart, James. You could barely do the second rep. So why did you think you could do another one? Did you know that being in the gym alone is prohibited by camp rules? Now do you understand why? I asked. I apologize, Debbie, for my mistake, and I assure you that it will not happen again. I am grateful to you for your help in saving me. I understand that this incident may give you another opportunity to mock me. So go ahead and tell others how you had to come to the aid of an overweight person once again. After that, I left. Debbie refrained from reprimanding and further complaining, just letting me go. The next day, after breakfast, I started exploring various gyms in search of an alternative group to join. I discovered a yoga class and a Pilates group that I had yet to try out. I decided to try to attend a step aerobics class. It seemed to me that this could be a pleasant experience, especially since there were many women and only a few men in the class. Just as I was about to enter the classroom, a voice attracted me from behind. James, it would really upset me if you went there, Debbie said, standing in her typical class outfit 
and not taking her eyes off me. Instead, why don't you join me in class today like you usually do? After that, I will be glad to talk with you. Okay, tomorrow you can do whatever you want, she said, holding out her little hand to me. I nodded in the affirmative and took it in return. Together with her, we returned to the classroom and took part in her lesson. After that, she asked, Please take a shower and gather here again. As instructed, I stood in front of the gym, waiting for Debbie to return. Unaware of her intentions, I assumed that she would lecture me again about the dangers of solitary training. I was well aware of the possible consequences of my actions, since they directly violated the safety rules in the camp, which could lead to my expulsion. It is likely that Debbie was going to discuss this issue with me, stressing that she was obliged to inform the camp director about me. Despite this anticipated conversation, I couldn't imagine feeling any worse than I did that morning. The news I received from the private investigator earlier was incredibly depressing. Sarah brought her new romantic partner to my house, where he stayed the night. My mind was preoccupied with how I was going to confront Sarah when Debbie suddenly appeared and spoke. I completely erased all memories of her from my thoughts. Debbie, despite her strict and disciplined nature, has a unique appeal. At 180 centimeters tall, she has charming blue-black hair and striking gray eyes. It gives me great pleasure to watch her turn and look over her shoulder as her hair cascades down and hides one side of her face, leaving only one eye visible. It seems as if this gaze penetrates deep into your soul, trying to determine if you have the ability to go beyond your capabilities and make that extra repetition that you never believed in. Although her curves are small, they are significant and greatly influence the choice of outfit. They are the ones who attract numerous men to her classes. Despite the difficult nature of her studies, many men willingly visit them to admire her. On the other hand, her backdrop presents a completely different picture. She may not be very big, but she is undoubtedly fit and well-defined. Its elasticity is so amazing that it is safe to say that you can bounce off it by a quarter. There are rumors that she may consider herself a lesbian, but it is important to remember that gossip can be deceptive. Despite the fact that the classrooms were already filled to capacity, she came in a casual hoodie and jeans, catching me off guard. It was an unprecedented sight to see her in such an outfit. With her hair elegantly styled on her head and huge sunglasses covering her eyes, this outfit would suit an ordinary woman for a routine visit to the mall, running errands or leisurely work in the yard on a lazy Saturday afternoon. But on Debbie, he ignited a lot of fantasies, enhancing her humanoid aura. She smiled at me warmly and glanced towards the exit. It confused me because I decided that we would talk. Debbie started. Calm down, James. You don't have any problems and you won't. I just want us to talk and usually when I want to think. I get into my Jeep and drive off into the desert. My head clears up and everything gets better. When I come back... I solved my problem. When I returned, I couldn't help but notice that the situation doesn't seem as terrible as it used to be. Perhaps it was a feeling of relief from stress or an opportunity to look at the situation more clearly, but something about it was effective. And then it dawned on me that, unaware that you, James, unwittingly became a source of problems for me. The weight of those words hit me like a ton of bricks. It was very unpleasant to realize that I had managed to add another problem to my already heavy load. She led me to the staff parking lot at the back, where an elegant black Jeep Wrangler was waiting for me. Once inside, I tensed, expecting a sharp acceleration. As I expected, she wasted no time and accelerated rapidly, forcing me to cling tightly to the edges of the seat. We drove along the highway for a short time, and then suddenly turned a corner onto an unmarked dirt road that I would undoubtedly have missed. Rushing through a scattering of trees and thinned hedges, the landscape gradually changed until eventually there was no trace of vegetation. In an instant, we were in the middle of a barren desert. In front of us stretched arid sandy expanses stretching into the distance to the mountains. Turning on the jeep's four-wheel drive, she slowed down slightly as we drove along a bumpy and uneven road. Feeling confident in her navigation skills, 
I just held on to the steering wheel. Eventually we reached a moderate-sized canyon cliff, where she applied the parking brake and got out of the car. Standing at the edge she stared into the distance, noticeably easing her tension, as if finding solace in this moment. When she looked at me, I met her intense gaze. James, what's going on with you? She asked, her tone full of disappointment. Initially, when you arrived here, you were just another well-off, pampered young man who didn't seem to understand the seriousness of this place. Accordingly, I didn't take you seriously either. Your frequent conference calls, late-night pizza get-togethers, and chatting with the buffoons in class have only reinforced this opinion. We come across a lot of people like you every year. You arrived here with excess weight and insufficient physical fitness, and if fate was kind to you, you managed to lose only four or five kilograms. After completing the task, head home and tell everyone about the difficult experience you just went through. Some people have even turned it into an annual tradition, making it a ritual. But something unexpected happened that made you change. I do not know the reason for this change, but it was obvious. On the first day, when you came to my class, boldly coming to the fore, I strongly doubted your ability to hold out even for ten minutes. I tried to dissuade you, but you persisted with unwavering determination. You left the class sweating profusely and I was still skeptical about the longevity of this newfound transformation. But in a surprising way, it aroused my interest. Over the past few weeks, I have witnessed an amazing change in you. Not only have you lost an amazing amount of weight, but you've also given your body an impressive shape. Judging by your current condition, you are almost not overweight anymore. Your physical transformation has been so amazing that I hardly recognize you as the person you were when you first arrived here. This comment took me by surprise, especially since it came from Debbie. As the transformations took place, it also concerned me. I've gone through amazing changes, going from doubting your stamina to becoming your most ardent supporter. After witnessing your late-night desert runs and late-night weightlifting classes, I was by your side. Therefore, it was no accident that I was present on that fateful evening when you overstepped yourself. As a rule, people who have lost half of the weight that you have, without even reaching the amazing level of physical fitness that you have now, experience deep satisfaction and joy. Their newfound confidence stems from the fact that they have achieved something truly outstanding. They are very proud of their successes and achievements, which will be celebrated at the upcoming ceremony before the camp closes for the season. You're going to get a lot of awards, although I have to keep it a secret. But it seems that you are not experiencing the expected happiness. Your emotions seem almost the opposite of normal. People usually come to this camp sad and depressed because of their weight and the ridicule they are subjected to. When they lose pounds, their mood lifts and they leave with increased self-confidence. Surprisingly, you arrived here already satisfied and maybe even a little angry. You radiated confidence and a sense of security. Your dedication and hard work surpassed anything I can remember. You looked amazing, but I can't help but notice how much sadder and more withdrawn you've become, and that upsets me too. You used to sit in the back among these jokers, laughing and radiating happiness, now you have become an inspiration for both vacationers and staff, but at the same time you isolate yourself, putting more and more effort into your solitary workouts. James, I know perfectly well what opinions people have about me in this place. I've heard all the nicknames they've thrown at me. I feel like I'm part of your journey to better health and weight control. For me, this is no longer just a job but a personal mission, to support and guide you on the path to positive change. Whether you understand the importance of these changes or not, it does not affect my desire to help you. Somehow along the way, you have turned from a simple customer into a person who holds a special place in my heart. I apologize for my explosion yesterday. The reason for my violent reaction was deeply personal to me. When I saw this barbell coming down on you, fear gripped me like never before. The thought that you were seriously injured or worse haunted me. I couldn't help but wonder if deep down you don't want that fate. The moment I looked at you I saw that the bar was coming down. 
I couldn't resist reaching out and hugging her. It was obvious that she needed to confide in someone, so I just listened to her. When she poured out her heart, sharing the details of her life, I realized that this was far from what I had expected. Initially, she started doing gymnastics, despite the fact that she did not have the compact and strong physique typical for most gymnasts. Unfortunately, her physique made her more susceptible to injury, which led to frequent failures. In addition, many of her fellow athletes resorted to the use of drugs and drugs to delay the natural process of breast development and hip expansion. Unlike them, she decided not to use such substances. As a result, her position in the ranking deteriorated rapidly, as it became increasingly difficult for her to compare with those who resorted to artificial improvements. With renewed vigor, she tried to revive her energy, but after a long period of fruitless efforts, she made the difficult decision to give up her previous studies. Despite the enormous difficulties, she decided to take up another sport. Possessing natural beauty, she decided to try her hand at fitness competitions. Although it wasn't exactly like bodybuilding, it still had similarities to it. However, the emphasis was on femininity and elegance, not on muscularity and massiveness. To her delight, she succeeded in this new field. The situation has worsened significantly. In many cases, women who win competitions and receive promotions have been forced to provide additional services to sponsors and judges. Even during her gymnastics career, she had always received attention from men. But now it seemed like an expected event. Unfortunately, there was a terrifying incident when she was almost attacked, but she narrowly escaped punishment thanks to her shrill screams, which alerted the security team. This incident destroyed her passion for fitness and forced her to make the difficult decision to return to school and start a new life path. After receiving degrees in exercise physiology and kinesiology, she began a career as a personal trainer. She has devoted herself to the camp for the last six years. All this time I felt an inexplicable connection with her, unlike any I've experienced lately. Opening up to her, I shared the reason for my presence in the camp, my wife Sarah. I confided in her, telling her how Sarah had recently humiliated me and expressed a desire to banish me in order to have an affair with someone more physically fit. I assure you, she will no longer feel uncomfortable in your presence, she claims. Moreover, the next time she sees you, she will be irresistibly attracted to you. I answered firmly. Actually, it's more likely that the next time she sees me is during the divorce process. Despite my attempts to understand her point of view, I could not deny that I was neglecting myself, and she had every right to want my physical condition to improve. However, her approach and offensive remarks towards me made me doubt her true feelings for me. The cheating incident was a turning point for me. It was the last straw that destroyed my trust in her. Perhaps over time I could forgive her for other actions, but now it seems impossible to regain that trust. That one night caused a significant shift, prompting Debbie to step up my training in her class. A lot of guys were jealous of me when I was doing push-ups with Debbie on my back. Sometimes she even joined me on night runs. Although our relationship remained strictly platonic, there were moments when her gaze sent chills down my spine. At the same time, tensions were rising at home. A private investigator found out that Sarah had stopped having an affair with her college friend, who seemed to be stalking her solely for physical reasons. This man practically moved into my house, staying there for several days a week, and it seems even his own wife was unhappy with the situation. The turning point came when he and Sarah got into a heated argument. Sarah tried to break off their relationship because the feeling of excitement and attraction had faded, and he did not want to loosen his grip. As a result, she started contacting me more often, looking forward to my return home. She left sincere messages expressing her longing and affection for me. When the camp closed for a month at the end of the season, I realized that I would have to return home soon. Debbie and I decided to go shopping together as I was in dire need of new clothes, having recently lost a staggering 100 pounds. None of my old outfits fit me anymore. 
As we strolled through the bustling mall, my gaze caught on something I had always dreamed of, but considered unattainable. A bright red Mustang displayed in the parking lot directly opposite. Intrigued, I couldn't resist the temptation and went to the parking lot to take a closer look at the car. To my surprise, the door was ajar, inviting me to sit down. The memories of my former self, who weighed 100 pounds more, came flooding back to me. I used to have difficulty squeezing into my not-so-great car, but now I have no difficulty getting in and out of the car, which really brings me joy. Determined, I found the seller and began to process the necessary documents. After my credit was verified and I arranged for the transfer of funds, I eagerly drove out of the dealership in my favorite new car. Debbie rode behind in her trusty Jeep as we drove back to camp. Taking responsibility, I quickly called a private investigator and a lawyer, making sure that they were aware of the upcoming event, and asked them to prepare the necessary documents. I asked the messenger to deliver the papers directly to my camp, leaving no room for error. I called Sarah and informed her that the camp would end next weekend, followed by a ceremony for the families and friends of the camp participants. Sarah was enthusiastic about the event and seemed to be looking forward to seeing me again. But I warned her not to get too excited, as this event may not bring her joy. In response, she shared her recent realization. James, I realized that looks are not everything. It is much more important to be with a person who sincerely loves and supports you, regardless of their weight. I earnestly ask you to return to our house despite the slight weight loss. This is very important for our future life together. I deeply love and miss you. During this entire period of loneliness, I had plenty of time to reflect on my desires and needs. I miss the presence of my affectionate and caring partner. After this remark, our conversation came to an end. Unaware that I knew about her infidelity, she continued to act as if everything was normal between us. I was silent too, not saying a word. In the following days, I embarked on a series of significant actions that led to changes in both my personal life and my professional career. Some of these beginnings were hidden from Debbie as she turned into a separate fairy tale. As the ceremony approached, she became more dependent and focused on cleanliness. On the eve of the event, we had dinner together, and I had the opportunity to express my gratitude to her for her help and motivation. To my surprise, she briefly took my hand while we were talking. It looks like our time together has come to an end. Your wife will be joining the ceremony soon, which will allow you to return to Ohio to confront or possibly end your relationship. I must admit, I did not catch the hidden sadness in her voice, because my thoughts were busy with other things. The car ride back to camp was filled with an awkward silence that carried the weight of many unspoken words between us. In the end, she broke the silence. I understand and recognize your honesty as a person, so I think that you would not think about continuing a relationship if you were married. But I'm curious if you've made a decision about whether you intend to make peace with her. Basically, I'm wondering if there's a chance that someone will be able to arrange my trip to Ohio in the near future. In return, I want to assure you, Debbie, that we have always been honest with each other. And even if you don't know about it, I have deep feelings for you. Therefore, I see no reason to deceive you now. I can't confirm the availability of plane tickets to Ohio or any other destination, but the offer is not harmless. She approved the idea with a nod, and I did not meet with her again until the ceremony itself. The next day seemed unusual to me. I woke up early and went for my lonely run. While most of the campers seemed to have completed weeks or months of exercising and dieting, running became an integral component of my personality. Therefore, the fact that it was no longer mandatory did not mean that I would neglect it. I searched for Debbie for a long time, but she was nowhere to be found. Some of the staff informed me that she had retired to her living quarters and was not feeling well. There were rumors that Sarah was frantically scouring the entire complex, trying to find me. For the sake of a joke, I decided to play it by going in search of the assembly hall. I noticed her and walked past her, but she didn't recognize me. 
To confirm my suspicions, I looked around to make sure the messenger was present. And indeed, he was there. I went to meet him. I informed him that I would give the signal at the right moment, and advised him to be on the lookout. He agreed to my plan. When the ceremony began, everyone entered the hall. I was lucky enough to witness an amazing sight. I noticed Debbie standing relatively close to Sarah, which gave me the opportunity to compare them directly. But comparing them was like comparing apples with oranges. Sarah is the owner of short blonde hair and a slim, tall build. She may not be as physically strong as Debbie, but she's still slim and attractive. On the contrary, Debbie has a breathtaking beauty that wins hearts, despite her short stature. In the midst of the conversation, Debbie started talking about something seemingly related to me, which caught Sarah's attention. Overwhelmed with emotion, Sarah ran out from behind the table and preferred to find solace in another chair. When I caught her looking at me, I smiled warmly, but Sarah only looked away, causing me to grin. Obviously, she perceived me as a stranger trying to flirt. Over the past few months, she has been involved in a complicated romantic relationship with her former college acquaintance, who, as it turned out, was married. She brought him to my house and put him in my bed, but now she was too innocent to let a stranger even smile at her. Isn't life a strange thing? During the ceremony, Sarah turned her head at every mention of my name, hoping to catch a glimpse of me. In the end, I was invited to go up on stage and receive my awards. One of them was awarded for the largest number of kilograms lost in one month, and the other for the overall achievement in weight loss. I received the previous award for being the most inspiring participant in the camp. It was obtained as a result of the fact that I turned from a person who has no shape into a person who has lost significant weight and improved my overall physical shape and lifestyle. My path has served as a motivating example for others. Standing on the stage and addressing the audience, I couldn't help but notice how charmed Sarah was. She was sitting on the edge of her chair, clearly amazed at my appearance. She seemed to be unable to believe that the obese man she had known before was standing in front of her. I was asked to say a few words, and I gave an inspiring speech about my personal path and the source of my motivation. In addition, I expressed my gratitude to Debbie by inviting her on stage to publicly express my sincere appreciation. The reaction from the audience and fellow representatives was stormy. They applauded as Debbie made her way to me. It was impossible not to notice Sarah's intense gaze directed at her as she passed. That gaze could have been deadly if the stairs had such power. After multiple hugs, Debbie shook my hand, and the director made some concluding remarks. After the ceremony, everyone went to dinner. When most of the people had left the room, Sarah suddenly came up to Debbie and me, visibly angry. She exclaimed, No wonder you insisted on staying here for so long. You intended to betray me with this woman while I was patiently waiting for you at home. I replied, Sarah, please understand that Debbie and I are just friends at this stage. I'm sorry, my love, she confessed. It's just that when I saw you, I couldn't help but envy you. You look incredibly attractive and transformed. I've spent countless days in this empty house longing for your return. Loneliness consumed me. I'm looking forward to coming home and getting to know a new version of you. Curious, I asked. So you endured loneliness and longing? She nodded her head vigorously in agreement. My curiosity was aroused when I showed her a photo on my phone of her in a restaurant with Thomas. In a curious tone, I asked who she had been seen with. So who is this person you're spending time with? I asked. In response, she calmly replied, Oh, it's just an old friend from college that I ran into by chance. He means nothing to me. Disappointed, I retorted sharply, No, he means something, Sarah. It's because of him that our marriage is falling apart. I am well aware of your connection with him even before my departure. I know that your real motive for wanting me to go to the camp was to be with him. It became clear to me that you were ashamed to be seen with a loving and devoted husband who turned out to be overweight, and instead you wanted someone with a more attractive physique who could meet your needs. I have proof of your admission of this, 
so there's no point in trying to deny it. Besides, I have photos of you bringing him to our house. This was our common home, Sarah, and you had intimate relations with him in our bed. There's no need to say anything else. While preparing to leave, I signaled to my lawyer's messenger, who quickly came over and handed her the divorce papers. She began to beg, Darling, we can talk about everything. It's over, it was just an affair, a mistake. I ended it because I genuinely missed you. I came to my senses and realized that I love you, and you love me. We have more in common than anyone I know. I have to admit the only aspect that bothered me about you was your excess weight. But that's not the case anymore, she said. Sarah, it looks like we both have a moment of clarity. After learning about your infidelity, I realized that I couldn't bear to marry a woman who was ashamed of me. The excitement of our marriage lessened when I heard your hurtful remarks about me. But I cannot deny one truth. We have common features. It was unpleasant for you to communicate with a heavier person, and therefore you decided to push me away. I am ashamed to be in the company of a woman who is cheating on me, so it would be better if you left. She begged, let's find a way to overcome this. Come home and we'll talk it over. If necessary, we can ask for professional help. We have so much in common it's not worth throwing it all away. I replied, the decision has already been made. In our state, guilt is not taken into account, and the judge will most likely divide our property equally. Since we don't have children, we don't need arguments. Our house makes up a significant part, about 70% of our total wealth. You have managed to achieve a much better agreement than the one that the court would have awarded you. It is in our mutual interests to get out of this situation and win. I understand that at least you are in a better position than me, who is homeless now, I said, and tears streamed down her face. Worried, she asked, but where will you live? Why don't you stay with me and let me fix it? In response, I calmly stated, You haven't shown any concern for me since you started your affair, so I don't understand your sudden concern. I refuse to continue living with you in this house, that's why I gave it to you. I'm starting my life with a clean slate next to a girl who will accept and appreciate me for who I am. During my time here, I managed to lose over 100 pounds. But in the process, you lost a devoted husband, a loving home, and the potential to create a wonderful family. All because your priority was to have fun elsewhere. My weight was just a convenient excuse that you used to justify your indiscretion. In my eyes, you are the real winner in this situation. Having said these words, I left, leaving her standing in place. After that, my communication with her was limited to communication with our lawyers until the divorce process was completed. But there was an exception when her father called me. He expressed concern about her unhappiness and asked if I would like to visit her to resolve the lingering tension. In response, I felt obliged to tell her about the specific reasons for our breakup and what actions she had committed. I even offered to provide evidence in the form of photographs, audio, and video recordings if he needed proof. When he heard that, he just wished me well and ended the conversation. I humbly accepted his advice and gratefully complied with it. Sarah's departure went smoothly and without any complications. Although we keep in touch from time to time, it doesn't really matter. In the end, Debbie and I decided to take advantage of our romantic inclinations and became a couple. Our life blossomed, surprising my family, friends, and colleagues with amazing changes in both my appearance and overall well-being. They have a deep affection for Debbie and often assure me that I made the right choice. I'm happy that we found each other. Sarah decided to sell her house and temporarily move in with her parents. Eventually, she got into a relationship and noticed the weight gain. In an attempt to help her, I prudently sent her a brochure about a fitness boot camp that I myself participated in. It wasn't my intention to brag or make her feel bad, but I sincerely wanted to offer her a solution that turned out to be effective for me. I even offered to pay her expenses on her behalf. It's worth noting that if she hadn't been embarrassed by my presence, I would never have met Debbie. Unfortunately, Sarah politely declined my offer. It seems that in the end, everyone was satisfied. After a grueling day at work, I returned home, but found that my wife was missing. Jane? 
I called, hoping to get her attention. I'm back! Her playful response came from above. I'll be right down, Tarzan. It was our special inside joke that originated the day we met at a costume party. In the Tarzan costume, our paths almost crossed, and I politely apologized. But before I could finish, she interrupted me by playfully poking me in the chest and exclaiming, You're Tarzan! Grinning mischievously, she pointed to her inviting cleavage and added, And I'm Jane! Her infectious laughter filled the air, creating an unforgettable memory. To my surprise, her name was really Jane, and we played the roles of Tarzan and Jane throughout our lives together. When five seemingly happy years of marriage were behind me, I opened a cold beer, settled on the couch, and turned on the six o'clock news. Just as the headlines were ending, Jane gracefully descended the stairs, leaving me in a daze. She was wearing my favorite little black dress, which clung to her mid-thigh, revealing a tantalizing glimpse of a cleavage that, while not worthy of a red carpet, was definitely not modest. I couldn't help but notice that the dress was completely backless. She was not wearing a bra, which was noticeable by the movement of her breasts. Besides, she was wearing a necklace that I gave her for our anniversary just a month ago. Intrigued by this sight, I reached for my phone, intending to capture this moment, but I had no idea what true purpose it would serve. Well, I said smoothly, I didn't know we had plans. Give me some time to freshen up and change my clothes. Where exactly are we going? To my surprise, she replied, We're not going anywhere. Robert Cohen invited me to dinner and dancing tonight. I'll probably be late so you can continue without me. Bob Cohen, a man who has faced the consequences of his inappropriate behavior towards married women at corporate parties, is not quite correctly portrayed as a scoundrel. In fact, the situation was provoked by an overly cautious woman and her possessive husband who caused an unnecessary commotion. But as a worried husband, I cannot allow you to communicate with him. Please understand my point of view. Ignoring my concerns, she defiantly headed for the exit, exclaiming, I don't belong to you. It's true that you don't belong to me, but our wedding vows meant commitment to each other. I cherish these vows and I believe that you do too. Please don't dismiss traditional values as outdated. In the modern era, no one holds such beliefs anymore. It would have been better if you had informed me earlier, which would have allowed us to end the marriage and continue our free relationship. Get divorced! She exclaimed, throwing her head back with a grin. As she headed for the exit, I quickly took an old bat out of the closet. Look, Robert is already here. Treat yourself to pizza or something else. With that, she left. Jane, I called, and when she turned to face me, I quickly took off her dress, leaving her there in nothing but a revealing black thong and high-heeled shoes. She hesitated for a moment and hurriedly disappeared into the house. Meanwhile, I began to make my way to the Lexus, casually tapping the Louisville slugger on my left palm. Cohen quickly backed up and screeched away from the scene, ignoring the neighbors who witnessed Jane's unexpected antics I calmly returned to the house and put the bat in the closet. Grabbing a chilled beer instead of a warm one, I lay down on the bed, anticipating the ensuing chaos. I didn't have to wait long for Jane to come back wrapped in a bathrobe. Her anger was obvious. It was hard to keep up with her when she was ranting and raging, as Paul Simon said. She was saying words that I had never heard before, even in the Bible. I just sat there and waited patiently for her to calm down. Finally, I asked her, What were you thinking? Or were you even thinking? Her answer took me by surprise. I don't know. Our life has become so monotonous, devoid of the old fun. Why am I only finding out about this now? And let's not forget about those many attempts to convince you to try something else. Your constant preoccupation, lack of interest and aversion to intimacy have always been obvious. But why humiliate me by trying to deceive me? I never wanted to betray you. I believed that if I confessed my desires, it would not be considered treason. But such a notion is completely absurd. 
Entering into an intimate relationship with someone else without my consent is definitely cheating. Maybe you thought you could get my approval. You've really lost your mind. I have to leave this place before I say or do something that will haunt both of us. I quickly picked up the keys and left before she could get up from her seat. Acting like any other stoic person, I sought solace in my favorite bar, quenching my sorrows in a glass of beer. Sam, the bartender, noticed my dejection by putting another bottle in front of me. What's bothering you, John? You look like you've lost your dearest friend, he asked. I replied, maybe you're not far off the mark, Sam. When I got home tonight, Jane was dressed to the highest standard and informed me that she was going on a date with some disgusting colleague telling me not to wait. Sam asked, of course, did you express your disapproval? I confirmed, yes, I have expressed it. What kind of fool do you take me for? I was about to wipe that stupid grin off his face when he jokingly said, I'm kidding, man. And what happened next? Well, she started talking the usual nonsense about me not possessing her. She claimed that loyalty was outdated. I suppose you didn't believe her lies. You guessed right. Just at that moment, this jerk pulled into the driveway and Jane jumped out the door. But she didn't go far. What did you do then? I quickly grabbed the bat out of the closet, followed her outside and forcibly tore off her dress. She stood motionless for a moment before it dawned on her that her form-fitting figure was visible to all the neighbors. She hurriedly disappeared to a safe place at home. When I went to the car, clutching my convincing Louisville slugger, the attacker quickly disappeared. It looked like your victory. And now, what brings you to my humble establishment? But the triumph was short-lived. I sat sipping a beer while she came down the stairs. Her anger was obvious. Calming down a bit, she resumed her tirade about nonsense. Our intimate life has become monotonous. Perhaps it wouldn't have been considered treason if she hadn't been doing things like this behind my back. At that moment, I realized it was time to leave. And here I am. Sam opened some more chilled drinks, and we toasted until they were empty. Before the idea of driving drunk came to mind, I drank the last glass. Good night and good luck, John, he said goodbye. Thanks, Sam. I have a feeling I'm going to need it, I replied. When I got home, Jane had already left for the night. Following my evening routine, I changed into pajama bottoms and climbed into bed, facing Jane. As I drifted off to sleep, I heard the faint sounds of her muffled sobs, but I chose to dismiss them. When I came down the stairs, I found Jane already bustling in the kitchen preparing breakfast. The meal passed in silence until we had cleaned ourselves up, and then Jane resumed her conversation. John, why can't you understand that times have changed? People are no longer expected to devote their entire lives to just one person. I replied, well, I think otherwise, and I don't think I'm alone in this belief. As for the concept of lifelong commitment, Neither of us has been affected by previous meetings, entering into relationships with other people. You know that wasn't part of my plan. It's just that we were young and inexperienced back then. We had very little knowledge about how things worked. But now we have gained more life experience and have a better understanding. There is no need to compare anymore. I've already made a lot of comparisons before I propose to you. I asked you to marry me because I was sure you were the one I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. And when you said yes, it meant that you felt the same way. Have you been dishonest? No, but... But what? Has your heart changed? If that's the case, maybe we should consider a divorce? I don't want to get divorced. Well, you can't have both. If you're against divorce, then you need to forget about this nonsense, I muttered, not taking my gaze off her. Reluctantly, she confessed, I don't want to get divorced, although there was uncertainty in her words. Despite Jane's assurances that she had given up the idea of being with another man, I could hardly believe her. I started to worry if she arrived a little later than expected, especially without a prior call. Gradually, fear settled in me, convincing me that she might still harbor desires to have an affair, only this time behind my back. Therefore, 
I began to try to follow her actions unnoticed. I didn't hire a private investigator, install bugs in her phone, or follow her with GPS. Instead, I started surprising her by showing up unannounced at lunch on different days and calling her at non-traditional hours. The tension between us began to build, and I felt that she felt it too. This tension even affected our intimate moments, making them less spontaneous and passionate than before. In the end, I plucked up the courage and told Jane that I wanted a divorce. She was completely stunned and expressed her disbelief by saying, But I thought we were fine. Do you honestly believe that everything is fine with us? That we are at least remotely similar to how things used to be or how they should be? She looked down, shaking her head in disagreement. Sharing the truth with my parents was undoubtedly the hardest part. They couldn't understand why we couldn't come to terms with our differences. The family inundated us with new questions. To spare Jane the humiliation, I let the blame fall on me. But in the end, I had no choice but to reveal the photo and tell her what she was trying to do. She reached out to me seeking sympathy for the criticism she was facing. John, is there anything that could make you reconsider the decision to divorce? I thought about it, putting my hand on my chin and came up with an idea that I knew she would never agree to. All right, Jane. I will not continue the divorce, but I will temporarily suspend it on one condition. Her face instantly lit up with hope. Anything, John. Anything. Just be careful what you say because anything includes a huge number of possibilities. I'm not worried, she reassured me. I'm sure you won't lose control. May I ask what you want? I don't mind you dating other men, as long as I have the opportunity to date other women. I noticed a faint smirk on her face before she covered it with a sugary smile. Of course, John. It seems fair, she replied, and the word bitch echoed softly in my mind. I bet she didn't expect me to find another woman. But I have one condition, I added. Which one? What is it? She asked her excitement becoming obvious. I knew she already had a potential partner, and I suspected she was worried about what would happen if I couldn't find someone. I decided to do something interesting for her. If I don't find a date within two weeks, you can go on a date yourself. This made her incredibly happy, and she hugged me tightly, showering me with kisses. She thanked me, saying that this is exactly what we need to bring the spark back into our marriage. She didn't know that I had ulterior motives. A few days later, I surprised her by telling her that I had found a couple and suggested the idea of a double date next Friday. Jane thought she had outsmarted me by agreeing to go on a date, believing that I would stay at home alone. Little did she know that I was already making plans for my own date, intending to end this stupid game once and for all. On Monday, during my lunch break, I took the opportunity to buy new clothes and discreetly left them in the car. Then on Friday I left work early to get my hair done and make sure I got home before Jane. Sneaking into the guest room, I quickly took a shower, shaved and brushed my teeth when I heard the sound of the garage door opening. Gathering my resolve, I went into the bedroom to finish my preparations. When I came out of the guest room in a fresh outfit and with a new hairstyle, I realized that I had caught her off guard but she quickly regained her composure. Robert will pick me up at 6.30 p.m. Our table at Amelia's is booked for 7 o'clock. In case you arrive before us, the table is booked in my name, I informed her, heading for the exit. Jane didn't know that there was a new addition to our workplace named Anna. Anna, a stunning red-haired girl, easily turned the head of every American man with red blood when he passed by. One look into my sad eyes brought her out of her playful state. Oh, John, I'm sorry, she said, her warm hand gently resting on mine. I didn't mean to mock you, but you're usually so calm. You look like you've lost your dearest friend. Tears welled up in my eyes, forcing me to look away. In a comforting gesture, she put her arm around my shoulders and led me to a table while I clutched my drink in my hands. She sat down patiently next to me, giving me time to gather my courage and tell me about my grief. Well, she finally spoke up. There's only one course of action we can take. We are. Yes, we can. I will accompany you as your mate, 
she replied. I burst out laughing for the first time since Jane shared her outrageous idea. Confused, she asked why I was laughing, to which I replied, You're serious. Looking into her eyes, I expected a playful twist that never happened, but in the end, I realized that she was sincere. I was overwhelmed with questions about why she chose me. I know about your principles, that you do not interfere in the affairs of married and even single men. If the slightest opportunity presented itself, every straight man and half the gay men in the office would line up just to get a chance to date you. I'm not interested in an ordinary date. As you have already said, I have the opportunity to meet with almost anyone I wish but I'm genuinely attracted to you. Maybe it's because you don't constantly objectify me with your gaze. Of course, I admit that sometimes it happens, but it's natural. At the same time, you always treat me with respect. During our meetings, you listen carefully to my ideas and support me when other men reject them just because they come from me. The most important thing is that I genuinely like you. Moreover, I am unhappy with your wife for the way she treats you disrespectfully. So would you like to go on a date with me? Even though I was born at night, I certainly wasn't born yesterday. These confident words came out of my mouth as I finished my drink, preparing for what was to come. After walking Anna to her car, we exchanged numbers and had a friendly hug before she drove away. At that moment, I felt that my life was about to take an exciting turn. After parking at Anna's house, I barely had time to get out and open the door of her car as she walked up to her. Standing next to her, I noticed that she was a little taller than Jane, but still shorter than me. Unlike Jane's ill-fated little black dress, Anna's outfit gracefully expanded just above the knees, adding an alluring touch to her appearance. A form-fitting emerald green dress hugged her body, and a bold slit on the left side reached almost to her hip. The bright color perfectly complemented her wavy, fiery red hair, which cascaded down to her waist. The revealing outfit showed off a lot more cleavage than I'd ever noticed on Jane, and as I helped her into the car, I was close to encountering a possible wardrobe malfunction. As I got into the driver's seat, my gaze was caught by her creamy white thigh peeking through it before she straightened her dress and greeted me with an infectious grin. We're going to have our moments, cowboy, she said playfully. My composure was a little shaky, and I made a subtle correction before setting off. I felt a wave of embarrassment wash over me as she let out a throaty laugh. As if my self-awareness wasn't at its peak anyway, she began gently tugging at my thigh, which made my excitement burst out again. Fortunately, we got to the restaurant just in time, before the situation escalated and I managed to regain my composure when we entered the hall. Jane and Robert were already sitting at the table. I had already run into Robert several times, and his appearance that evening did not make a greater impression on me than before. But Jane was fully armed, and I couldn't remember ever seeing her so incredibly attractive. Robert stayed where he was, and I didn't hold out my hand to him. Instead, I just nodded to Jane, helping Anna to take her place. It was obvious that Jane was stunned by the sight of my stunning companion. She seemed ready to make a sarcastic comment, but wisely refrained from doing so. Robert, on the other hand, was fixated on Anna's revealing outfit, which made Jane imperceptibly nudge him in the ribs, reminding him not to look away. At first, I expected the dinner to be uncomfortable, but after a hesitant start, the atmosphere gradually relaxed. To a casual viewer, we looked like two ordinary couples, completely unaware of the unconventional dynamics between us. After a delicious dinner, we went to the club to drink and dance. Under the cheerful rhythms in the air, everything seemed harmonious and carefree. But when the slow melody began, there was an obvious tension. During these intimate dances, I found myself entwined with Anna. The intensity of our bond was palpable, and Jane's piercing gazes could cause spontaneous combustion. At the same time, Jane, without holding back, provocatively clung to Robert, making movements that did not leave the imagination indifferent. 
She seemed oblivious to the stares and inevitable gossip that usually brought her to shame. It was as if she had created her own secluded kingdom, divorced from social norms. When Robert's hand went under her dress, I couldn't help but feel a surge of embarrassment for her. Trying to distract attention from the awkward situation, I led Anna back to our table. From there we watched Jane and Robert make a spectacle of themselves, oblivious to the fact that they were attracting attention to themselves. In the end, the manager intervened in the conversation, patting them lightly on the shoulder. Although I couldn't hear the conversation, it was clear that they were being asked to leave. Jane, in tears, hurriedly returned to our table, grabbed her package and hurriedly left the club, and Robert hurried after her. Well, you definitely know how to show a girl an unforgettable time, Anna remarked, breaking the tension with a playful giggle. With laughter still bubbling inside me, we returned to the noisy dance floor. When we finally decided to leave, I approached the manager, ready to make amends. I would like to apologize for the behavior of our comrades, I said humbly. The manager, always understanding, reassured me. Don't worry, sir. Of course, we do not consider you responsible. But the sense of responsibility did not leave me. I couldn't help but confess. I must admit that this woman was my wife, or rather, my ex-wife, and I suspect that her actions were caused by jealousy of my date here. The manager, slightly taken aback, looked at my companion and then smiled warmly. I understand, sir, he replied, his tone compassionate. Please remember that you are always welcome here again. It's time to get back to work, he said, starting his duties. After walking Anna to her house and reaching the door, I bent down to kiss her goodnight in a friendly way. To my surprise, instead, she pulled me towards her for a passionate kiss. Would you like to come over for a drink at night? What is it? She asked, hinting at something more than just a drink. Although I suspected her intentions, I decided not to argue. I had to forget about the night cocktail as soon as the door closed behind us. She threw me down on the couch, sat me on her lap, and we shared an intimate moment. As a result, I stayed the night at Anna's, and in the morning I woke up to a gentle kiss. After taking a shower separately, I took the opportunity to surprise her with breakfast while she wrapped up. Her reaction was priceless. Wow! She exclaimed. Not only a wonderful lover, but also a skilled cook. Maybe you're just a guardian. When we sat down at the table to enjoy our meal, I decided it was time to talk about something important. By the way, I began, I want you to know that you are very dear to me. Last night was just incredible, the best event of my life. But I have unresolved issues in my marriage that I need to sort out. Even if we get divorced, I can't guarantee when I'll be emotionally ready for another relationship. She immediately calmed me down. Don't worry, John. I was just making fun of you. I want you to know that I have feelings for you too. But I understand your situation, and I'm willing to be patient. If everything goes well, I can imagine that we will have a relationship. But you're right. It is extremely important for you to resolve all issues with your wife first. After finishing the meal, we had a casual conversation until I realized that I needed to go home and assess whether there was an opportunity to save our marriage. When I entered the house, I found Jane sitting at the kitchen table, clutching a cup of coffee tightly in her hands. Her tear-stained eyes met mine as she raised her head. The sight of my contented face caused a new wave of tears. I poured myself a cup of coffee and sat down opposite her. How was your evening with Robert? Oh, John, it was absolutely terrible. All the time, my mind was preoccupied with thoughts of you and Anna. She is incredibly attractive and stunning. I understand that I will never be able to match her. But it's important for you to realize that you wouldn't have to worry about competing with her if you hadn't started this nonsense. She did not meet my gaze, but silently acknowledged my rightness. I can say for sure that you wouldn't feel such remorse if it were just... You and Robert, and I was sitting at home alone. She raised her head, her eyes filled with tears. Jane's gaze moved down and she nodded again. I'm at a loss what to do, she admitted. 
Part of me just wants to let you go and start over with someone else. Tears began to flow down Jane's face and she openly sobbed. I can't help but imagine you with Anna, and it breaks my heart. Despite my pain, I couldn't help but look at the woman I once married, the woman who captured my heart. I no longer saw an evil person, but rather a naive girl. At that moment, hope was kindled in me, the hope that maybe we could find a way to get back to each other. Jane raised her head, her eyes full of tears and hope. I'm going to change my outfit and leave the house for a while, I said quietly. While I'm gone, I suggest you move your things to the guest room. We can discuss this after my return. John, please think about it. How can we reconcile if we are physically separated? I need your presence now more than ever. You don't understand my prospects. Reunification is not a guaranteed result. Maybe you should have thought about your dependence on me before starting this situation. With these words, I continued to climb the stairs to our now exclusively mine bedroom. Jane stayed at the table while I went down the steps, heading for the exit. John, she called, making me stop and look at her face. I love you. With just a nod, I quietly left the house. I understand that my actions may seem heartless, but it was necessary for her to realize the fragility of our marriage. Walking along the Charles River, I leisurely watched the rowers gracefully gliding on their shells and the sailboats feasting on the water surface. In the end, I sat down on a bench, being surrounded by numerous families accompanied by small children. A feeling of melancholy came over me when I wondered if I would ever witness the birth of the children that Jane and I often talked about. Time seemed to slip away as I sat, and as the sun began to set, I was gripped by a chill. Exhaling deeply, I resigned myself to the circumstances. I got up and walked wearily towards our house. When I entered the house, I found Jane still sitting in the same place where I had left her. There was a flicker of hope in her eyes as she looked at me, but I just shook my head sadly and headed upstairs, closing the door behind me. Sighing, I took off my shoes and flopped down on the bed, fully dressed. I covered my eyes with my hand not knowing how much time had passed before a light knock on the door broke the silence. After that, there was a whisper. John. Ignoring the call, I remained silent, and after the second attempt, I heard her footsteps moving away towards the guest room along the corridor. After making sure she was gone for the night, I hurriedly took a shower and fell into an unbroken doze. When I came down the stairs, I was greeted by a hearty breakfast prepared by Jane. To my surprise, I turned out to be quite hungry, while Jane was just picking at her food. John, she said, do you think we should think about consulting? The concept of consultation echoed in me, leaving me unsure and unaware of its purpose. Will they try to persuade me to agree with Jane's thoughtless ideas? Am I really interested in solving our problems? During the meeting with Anna, I realized that our intimate relationship had become monotonous and uninteresting. It made me doubt that I really wanted to return to this mundane state. Besides, I couldn't help but resent Jane for never expressing her displeasure. Still, I recognized that I still had love for Jane in my heart, and I was determined not to give up without a fight. Okay, Jane, let's give the consultant a chance, I suggested. Her reaction was instantaneous. She almost jumped up from her seat. Clarifying my position, I said, but let's be clear from the beginning. I don't need a counselor who will focus solely on saving our marriage. Maybe he can be saved, and maybe not. I don't accept any ulterior motives or ulterior motives. It was obvious to me that she felt cheated. Perhaps she imagined that she would meet a therapist with an unconventional approach that would confirm her philosophy of adapting to changing times but she had no choice but to admit the truth. The consultations turned out to be extremely successful. Jane began to realize that her unwillingness to cooperate with me directly contributed to her dissatisfaction with our intimate relationship, and I realized how important it was to be more assertive. We began to discuss our desires, needs, and expectations regarding our intimate life more often. Despite the fact that the consultations helped solve our problems, 
It was difficult for me to get over the betrayal that I felt towards her, even though I prevented her from fully realizing it. On the other hand, Jane had a hard time overcoming her insecurities about Anna. No matter how I tried to explain to her that my feelings for Anna were not romantic and that our date was just a way of asserting myself, she never understood. In the end, Jane and I came to a mutual agreement and decided to divorce amicably. After the divorce was finalized, I took the opportunity to evaluate my life, absolutely not. Instead of meeting Anna right away, I decided to book a room at a charming guest house on the main coast. Since it was still pre-season, the weather was uncertain, but it matched my mood perfectly. All I craved was some time to relax and embark on a journey of self-discovery, thinking about which path I wanted to take. When I returned, I eventually contacted Anna. We decided to have dinner together, and although I let her walk me to her bed, it was more for comfort than passion. At that moment, I couldn't help but think about how to just hold her close and ask for a permanent commitment. My affection for you is very deep. I admit, it would not be difficult for me to get my feelings for you, but I'm hesitant to start a relationship with you because my divorce is still fresh and emotionally complicated. I'm worried that a relationship with you might just become an echo. Perhaps it would be wise for both of us to look for other connections besides our own for a while. I can't determine how long this period should be, and I don't expect you to wait for me to figure it out. Although I would like to challenge your point of view, I'm afraid you're right. Although I think we have potential, it's better to be careful rather than regret it. When we woke up, we both went to the bathroom and took a shower separately. After that, we had a quiet breakfast together. Despite the temptation to abandon other plans, I remained determined, believing that she would have done the same. When we finished tidying up, she walked me to the door and we exchanged tearful hugs. I guess this is goodbye, she said. No, not goodbye, I replied. Just a temporary goodbye. How about we meet for dinner in two weeks, say on Friday to catch up? All right, she agreed. She kissed me on the cheek and let me out the door. The door closed like a cell door, and I wasn't sure I hadn't made a mistake in my life. Two weeks later, I finally met with Anna. We managed to have a nice conversation, and this time I just drove her to the house. Three days later we met again, and five months later she moved in with me. And only a year later we got married. And what happened to my ex-wife Jane? She quit her job and moved to another institution. After Robert was caught in the workplace with a female colleague, he was immediately fired from his job. He is currently confined to a hospital bed. Adding to his problems is the fact that the woman's husband, a former Marine, could not calmly cope with the situation. Robert's future is uncertain because after leaving the hospital he may lose his home. His wife, who has started divorce proceedings, seems determined to make life difficult for him. Five years have passed and I happened to meet Jane at a nearby diner. She didn't look much like her old self. She looked fragile and aged beyond her years. I discreetly signaled to Anna and we quickly left the diner without bothering to place an order. Although I noticed Jane's presence, I had no desire to engage in conversation with her. Life was simpler, without unnecessary problems. Although there were times when her taste did not quite meet my expectations, I got great pleasure from intimate contact with her. My journey began right after graduation, when I devoted eight years of my life to serving in the Special Forces. During this time, I have acquired extensive knowledge of the handling of weapons. After serving in the Army, I studied at an engineering school for six years, where I honed my skills even more. In the end, I decided to take a leap of faith and founded my own company, which today has turned into a multi-million dollar construction company. Few people know about my involvement in the war, as it remains a hidden chapter of my life. To overcome the inner turmoil that plagued me, I spent four years undergoing counseling, trying to exercise my personal demons. Therefore, I refrain from discussing this period because of the emotional journey it entailed. It is worth noting that I had a pilot's license even before the start of military service. 
I tried to take Kelly for walks but she didn't believe me. As soon as I saw Kelly I was blown away. Two years later we tied the knot. She came from a wealthy family. Her maiden name was Moore. She is a descendant of Richard Moore from the Mayflower. The whole Kelly family treated me with contempt, as if I were a mere servant. Despite this, I always tried to give her everything I could. I bought a luxury residence in Cambridge, Massachusetts, with a four-car garage, just to please her. She insisted on having a BMW. We had two children, or rather she had two children. John, who is 21, and his younger brother, who is 19, are in college. As a generous gesture, I bought brand new BMWs for each of them. Unlike them, I own a 10-year-old GMC four-wheel drive pickup truck. But about six years ago, their behavior towards me changed for the worse. Later I found out the reason for their disrespectful attitude. They completely ignore my instructions and just do what they want. But they willingly obey their mother, Kelly. Interestingly, I hired John as an employee eight years ago and considered him my closest friend. Surprisingly, the kids seemed to adore him. About a year ago, I came across Kelly's open email inbox. Out of boredom, I made the impulsive decision to read her email. To my utter disbelief, I came across some disturbing revelations. She confessed that she despised me from the moment we crossed paths. Surprisingly, her whole family shared this feeling towards me. Moreover, I learned the sad truth that the children I thought were mine are actually the offspring of my former closest friend, John. Surprisingly, this knowledge has been hidden from me for about six years. It turned out that John and Kelly had been in a relationship long before I hired him, and they took great pleasure in keeping this secret right under my nose. I agreed to sign a prenuptial agreement at the request of my father-in-law. The marriage contract expires in two and a half years, when our marriage turns 25 years old. One of the points of the agreement states that in case of infidelity by one of the parties, the culprit will be left with nothing. This point made me wary and turned to my friend Kevin, whom I met during the service for help. Kevin introduced me to a man named Paul, who is known for his knowledge in the field of surveillance. With Paul's help, I now have a personal account where copies of all Kelly's emails are automatically sent. In addition, I receive copies of my children's emails. I recently installed a comprehensive video surveillance system throughout the house that allows you to track phone conversations and videotape various activities. Thanks to Kevin's intervention, I did not resort to extreme measures against my family, who I believed had offended me. Instead, Kevin advised me of alternative ways to hurt them. These methods included attacking their finances, loans, family reputation, and personal pride with the intention of publicly shaming them. John and his friends are well aware of the manipulations I have been subjected to by my wife and children. They take pleasure in ridiculing and mocking me, knowing about the marriage contract and extramarital affair. I'm looking forward to the arrival of my best friend Tom, who has to take responsibility. I have a video recording of my father-in-law discussing a scheme to falsely imagine that I received money from him through my company. Their ultimate goal is to get John to take control of my business. This plan has been in development for many years, which explains why they arranged for him to be hired by my company and why he retains the appearance of my closest ally. The only people I can fully rely on are my old military comrades, to whom I am grateful that they keep in touch. To strengthen the security of my company, I hired Paul as a computer consultant. He set up surveillance in my company so that I could distinguish who is faithful and who is not. So, I had about 18 months to develop a divorce strategy. During this period, I had to pretend that I didn't notice the truth. Our physical intimacy decreased, and my actions were dictated by resentment that I had spent more than two decades on her. Reflecting on how badly she treated me, I entered into an intimate relationship with her, driven by the desire to cause pain. I entered into such a relationship only when I was sure that she had no connection with John, whom I specifically sent on business trips. Surprisingly, she didn't suspect anything. 
I understand that I was previously involved in a difficult situation, in which I behaved inappropriately, and was aware of some events related to John. But I decided to put it in the past, and pretend that I don't know anything about what happened. It is important for me to maintain the appearance of a close friendship with John. To embarrass her, I resorted to intimate acts with her in public places. I wanted her friends to witness these meetings. In addition, I went so far as to perform a DNA test to confirm that our children actually belong to John and not to me. Their plan was to use the divorce process and embarrass me while John was in control of the company. I quietly arranged a meeting with a company that was interested in acquiring my business. The buyer, who turned out to be a former competitor, was a man I had always considered honest. Despite this, I decided to sell my company at a lower price. I shared my thoughts with the buyer, stressing that this confidential information is known only to a select few, including our lawyers. Interestingly, the law firm I turned to for help also had a strong dislike for my father-in-law, which influenced my decision to hire them. They gave me recommendations, advising me to open a personal bank account and provide a personal phone number. They suggested that I convince Kelly and the kids to lease their cars instead of buying new ones, which would allow them to have a new car every year. In addition, it will save me from having to buy new cars and will be more economical. Everyone took this offer as an excellent one. After that, I began to discreetly pack my things and put them in a rented storage room. Some people openly or secretly mocked me. I suggested to Kelly that we file taxes separately and transfer the house exclusively to her name for tax purposes. Accordingly, to do this, we had to issue a new mortgage exclusively in her name. The whole family agreed that this was a brilliant plan because it would make it easier for her to get both a house and a divorce. My new law firm has also suggested this course of action to prevent any damage to my creditworthiness. She expressed a desire to build a swimming pool and make other changes to the house, and I readily allowed her to get whatever she wanted, even expressed my support and encouragement. But at the same time, she had to take out a second mortgage on the house. Naturally, these loans had to be issued exclusively in her name, since the house was now only in her ownership. Half of the funds were directed to the desired repairs, and the other half imperceptibly ended up in my personal account remaining unnoticed. Despite the criticism and ridicule, I took responsibility and handled all the bills in good faith. Anticipating unforeseen circumstances, I took the initiative to change the beneficiaries of the insurance so that charities would benefit after my death. Quickly and unnoticeably, I managed to sell my company, ensuring that the new owners retained all employees, with the exception of John and his assistants. During the year, I carefully prepared for my departure. As a gesture of goodwill, I offered to treat the whole family, including relatives and my former best friend John, to an unforgettable two-week trip to Europe. Although I could hear their mocking whispers, I remained indifferent, knowing that it was Kelly who would pay the bill. After all, I was the one who had the last laugh. Unbeknownst to anyone, I quietly acquired a vast 150-acre plot in a remote wilderness area in Alaska. The only way to get here was by plane, and this hidden treasure remained unknown to my family, who did not know that I still had a valid pilot's license. Imagining an autonomous shelter, I carefully developed plans for an elevated hut and shelter for my plane. Having hired a reliable construction company, I instructed them to build a house ready to move in but it took longer than expected to realize my dream. So I bought a modest house in Fairbanks, which served as a modest dwelling for me, where I could store my mobile home in a spacious garage, similar to a barn. When I wanted to travel, I needed to stay somewhere. Fortunately, my military friend recently purchased a new mobile home and registered it in his name. It turned out that he shared the same dislike for my relatives as I did. Although he tried to warn me about them, I was blinded by love and did not heed his advice. Despite his initial reluctance, I insisted on giving him $5,000 as compensation for registering the house in my name. 
in addition to the money I had allocated for the car itself. I also got my other friends to accept a monetary reward for their help. But after reading Kelly's letters, it became clear that they consider me a stupid and complacent person. As a result, I decided to stop paying for the house, their cars, and all insurance policies. The utilities were issued exclusively in Kelly's name, which means her credit would have been affected, not mine. To deal with this situation, I deftly bought a subscriber box in the name of Kelly and redirected all accounts there. Kelly and her family mistakenly believed that I was foolishly taking on all their expenses with my own money. They had no idea that after the divorce, Kelly's credit would be tarnished, not mine. Moreover, I strategically planned the termination of work in order not to pay alimony. As an additional measure of secrecy, I managed to hide the details of the sale of the company by transferring all funds to an offshore account. The new owners will feel that the company has disappeared, leaving no trace of its true value. I'm going to leave without telling anyone. Just before I left, I informed them of a sudden business need, assuring them that I would join them later. Surprisingly, they didn't look worried and were even glad that I wasn't going with them. The evening before they left, I made a special effort to leave Kelly with indelible memories. Our meeting was intense and passionate. Unfortunately, I also performed an intimate act with her that was unpleasant to her, as a result of which she became angry with me. This is sad for John, too, because he was intimately involved with Kelly, including in this way for many years, but at the same time rejected me. Returning to the house, I gathered all the things I needed and carelessly left the room unguarded. Then my friend Paul came to me and took his surveillance equipment, which he left at my house. With cash, I turned to the services of a shipping company to transport my limited possessions to Alaska. My belongings consisted mainly of clothes, tools, and fishing gear. As for my firearms, which were safely stored in a gun safe, I decided to transport them and store them until I arrived in Alaska. I intentionally left all the furniture so that my destination would remain unknown to others. My son Mike had never shown any interest in hunting or fishing, so he remained in the dark about the places I frequented. To ensure secrecy, I decided not to disconnect my previous phone account so that Kelly would not find out about my intentions. I planned to close the account about a month after my departure. Entrusting my old phone to an elderly acquaintance in the company, I told him not to answer calls from my wife, but gave him the freedom to call anyone he wanted for a month. Then I went to my relatives with a set of keys that gave me access. Unlocking the door, I entered their house. I managed to get hold of my so-called son's laptop and use it to post a message on the college's website about a week-long student party that took place at their home. No wonder they chose John over me, considering how frugal they've always been. I knew that this wild party would lead to their house, cars, and boat being completely smashed. After that, I went to the bank to close all my accounts and cancel my credit cards. I withdrew $50,000 from both my wife's account and my own. I also sold my truck to a car dealer. Three days later, the effects began to show. Without warning anyone, I went on a trip to Alaska. To keep up to date, I relied on my wife's email. Surprisingly, no one, including my wife, children, relatives, and even my former best friend, bothered to contact me and ask about my whereabouts. They didn't know that it was my wife, Kelly, who generously funded this adventure. While traveling around the country, I leisurely visited various attractions, relying on cash to cover all expenses. I set off on a journey from Bellingham, Washington, by boarding a ferry that took me to Valdez, Alaska. From there, I continued my expedition, reaching Fairbanks, and I did not need a passport. When I got to Washington State, I discovered that Kelly and her family had just returned from a vacation in Europe. They did not know that I was the organizer of the destruction that befell their homes and property. Strangely enough, they did not pay attention to my absence and were solely concerned with the condition of their home. Surprisingly, it was the authorities who started to find out my whereabouts, not my supposed loved ones. It was on Sunday, 
just a day after returning to the United States, that they began to unravel the situation. Before that, I gave my lawyer a written power of attorney to conduct the divorce proceedings. I informed them that I would contact them in two weeks, without revealing my location. Monday morning came, and Kelly was handed the divorce papers in connection with her adultery. I was thinking of suing John for alienation of affection, but unfortunately, such lawsuits are not allowed in Massachusetts. It seemed that many state politicians faced similar legal challenges. Unfortunately, John and his assistants were dismissed from their posts as part of the agreement I entered into with the new owners of the company. It was very sad to watch John lose everything that belongs to him. At the same time, Kelly found herself in dire financial straits, owing more money than she had in her bank account. All of her creditors relentlessly pursued her, which led to the seizure of cars and the cessation of the supply of necessary utilities, such as electricity and water. In addition, she had to pay property taxes, and both of her mortgages were overdue. Therefore, Kelly, along with two restless children, had to seek refuge with their parents at the hotel, as their own housing was completely trashed. To accommodate everyone, Kelly's parents had to rent cars for the whole family. I couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by the many problems they faced. In addition, John was forced to move in with them because of the damage caused to his own property. Desperate, he had to beg her parents to lend him a car. It was frustrating to watch them spiral downwards, changing from luxury BMWs to wrecked cars. In desperation, Kelly and her family resorted to the services of private detectives trying to find me. But their attempts to delay the divorce turned out to be a gross mistake, as the case became widely publicized after the publication of the results of the DNA test and the appearance of explicit videos on the internet with their participation. Thanks to the audio recordings, the duration of the affair became apparent, as well as the awareness and support of her infidelity by the whole family. It was frustrating to discover that the whole family conspired to publicly shame and ruin me, with an ulterior motive to seize control of my company. In addition, their contempt for the middle class became apparent. Shocking video and audio recordings testified to her family's involvement in bribing politicians and bribing government officials, which undermined the honesty and decency of honest people. In order to expose their actions, I made sure that this evidence was distributed on numerous sites specializing in such content. In the end, the divorce process was completed, but not without complications, as the appointed judge seemed to play a dubious role in the case. He had to leave because it turned out that he was one of the corrupt officials who took bribes. I tried to contact the children but my efforts were in vain, as they simply ignored me. Five years later I made a trip to Boston to complete some unfinished business. I visited a restaurant that I knew her family frequented. Passing by me they did not notice my presence, perhaps because of my long gray hair, beard, and improved physical condition. Taking advantage of the opportunity, I discreetly asked the waiter to bring a bottle of champagne to their table. Watching them, I noticed that the whole family had aged noticeably as if 20 years had passed since our last meeting. All eyes were on me, and then, a moment later, Kelly's voice broke through the tension. Oh my God, you despicable man! It was obvious that she recognized me, and without hesitation, revealed my identity to the rest of the group. In an instant, John rushed towards me, overcome with anger and thirst for retribution but I quickly disabled him with one well-aimed blow, leaving him unconscious. My ex-son followed, driven by the mistaken belief that he could surpass me. I quickly subdued him too, although he remained conscious. In the midst of the chaos, Kelly rushed to me, venting her rage that I had in her opinion destroyed her family and hurling insults in my direction. As the commotion grew, the arrival of the police marked the end of my freedom. Realizing the inevitability of this, I asked the waiter to contact my lawyer, as I doubted that the police would give me the opportunity to do this on my own. After studying the surveillance footage, I was cleared of all charges and released. 
The recordings clearly showed me calmly sending them champagne and having a peaceful conversation. This evidence strongly supported my claim of self-defense. I am grateful to my active lawyers, who had the foresight to obtain copies of the surveillance footage in advance. Because without this, the police would hardly have allowed me to be released. It is worth noting that the police officers involved in this case were acquaintances of my father-in-law. Subsequently, Kelly called me and expressed a desire to talk to me. Carefully assessing the situation, I arranged to meet her in the hotel lobby, making sure that our conversation would be recorded. During our meeting, she asked about my actions towards her and her family, demanding an explanation. I stared at her in disbelief. When I calmed down, I told them that I had discovered their plan against me and managed to outwit them before they could harm me. I confessed to her that I had found out about her affair with John and asked her why she decided to marry me if she hated him so much. But I withheld from her the details of how I installed wiring throughout the house and secretly monitored her email. As a result of their actions, she lost not only her house and car, but Mike suffered the same fate, and they had to seek refuge with her parents. When asked a question, she simply brushed it off, saying it was an impersonal decision made initially to escape from her family. Then she confessed that she found pleasure in making me do all these tasks for her, taking pleasure in the fact that I was left with leftovers and had to endure John's indiscretion. Curiosity got the better of me, and I asked why she didn't just divorce me when she met John. In response, she said that at that time he was a source of pleasure for her, and by staying married, she could achieve everything she wanted. I couldn't help but wonder if her plan was really working for her. Without saying a word, I got up from my seat and retired to my room. The next day, I made the decision to leave and return to Alaska in search of peace and tranquility, knowing that I had successfully disrupted their lives, tarnished their credit and affected their finances. Instead of resorting to cruelty, a more effective approach is to diminish their pride and tarnish their reputation, leaving an indelible impression in their memory.